Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Training and Communications Officer with Australian Biocommons. I'll also be your host for today. In this series, we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, tools and data for the life sciences community. Each month we hear from our national and international peers on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help Australian researchers like yourselves achieve your best environmental, agricultural and medical research. You can keep up to date with the latest news and events from Australian Biocommons using the channels that you can see on the bottom of your screen. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. For me in Brisbane, not too far from the river, this is the Turrbal and Yuggera people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country. And we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Part of the Biocommons mission is to provide and support life science research communities to access and use community scale digital infrastructure. One of the areas in which we're working towards achieving this is in human genomics. The Australian Biocommons has brought together a team from Zero Childhood Cancer, the University of Melbourne Centre for Cancer Research, the Australian Access Federation and Melbourne Bioinformatics to explore the use of Gen3 technology for the management and sharing of human genome data across Australia. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Associate Professor Bernie Pope from the Australian Biocommons and Melbourne Bioinformatics, Professor Oliver Hoffman from the University of Melbourne Centre for Cancer Research, Mr. Camille Toke from the Children's Cancer Institute, and Dr. Marie Wong from the Children's Cancer Institute to share their experiences and progress towards establishing Gen3 instances to better enable uh, human genome data sharing in Australia. Welcome to all of our speakers today, and I will now hand over to Bernie to tell you all about Gen3. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so I'll just set some context before we get into the other speakers. Uh, on this slide here, we can see predicted gro global growth of healthcare funded sequence human genomes. Um, and in the orange color line, we see those for rare diseases. Uh, blue is cancer. And if we add them together, we get the black line, which is the combined expected growth, which is, um, as you can see, um, far greater than a linear growth. Um, and in 2025, if we extrapolate out a little bit, we're expecting the storage requirements um, throughout the world to um, be in excess of exabytes to low zettabytes. And so clearly just from a volume um, perspective, um, this is a big challenge um, and uh, we need to think about how we're going to address this. Historically, um, a lot of human genomics data has been siloed, which means that it's largely been um, shared or stored um, in um, research organizations and, and shared in cliques, um, which, um, you know, has um, limited its reuse and reanalysis. Um, and therefore, um, we, we think that um, when um, data is shared, that, that increases its public benefit. Um, and, and sharing is actually, as we'll hear in today's talks, um, necessary in human health, especially in rare disease and cancer, because large cohorts are needed for statistical power. Um, however, national and international data sharing is, is even though it's highly beneficial, it, can, it requires considerable collaboration and coordination. And so um, internationally, um, this is recognized. And one of the major initiatives um, working towards um, solving these problems is the, G the GA4GH, which is the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Um, this organization is policy framing and technical standard setting. Um, and the Australian Genomics uh, is a driver project for GA4GH. Um, and we'll hear a bit more about that later on. Um, a key outcome for the GA4GH is specification for standard APIs for data sharing technology. And one, this diagram here, which is generated by the GA4GH, illustrates that um, human genomics data sharing in the data life cycle is it's, it's incredibly complex and involves many um, uh, participants um, throughout the data life cycle. And storing and sharing the data and analyzing it is one piece of a very larger um, uh, ecosystem. 
So if we think about um, the ecosystem of technology from the perspective of a researcher, which is illustrated here, um, we can think about the pieces that might fit together from a technological point of view. And we're gonna talk a bit about um, a, a few of those pieces in particular Gen 3 today. Um, so a researcher must identify themselves um, with, through some sort of identity access management system. Um, they can then search through various data holdings um, to establish something we would call a virtual cohort, which is a collection of data across different holdings using certain um, research criteria. Um, and then if they find um, suitable research data that they would like to use, they can put in a request to a data access committee to um, consider that application. If they're successful, they can retrieve the data and then bring it to some analysis platform for their research. Um, so what we're talking about today is a project called Establishing Gen3 to enable better human genome data sharing in Australia. And um, Gen3 was identified as a leading candidate for building human genomics data commons. Um, in the third quarter of last year, we established a pilot project to assess the use of Gen3 as the foundation for a human genomics data commons with the partners illustrated here um, on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, the project is now complete. And today um, we're very happy to provide an overview of the motivations for that project, the process that we went through and the findings. And so now I will hand over to uh, Marie to consider the next part of the talk. Thank you. All right, excellent. Hi, I'm Marie. I'm the Precision Informatics Manager, um, Precision Medicine Informatics Manager at the Children's Cancer Institute. And I'm going to tell you a bit about the motivation for why we were looking into Gen3 as a way to share our data. So in Australia, the CCI leads the ZERO program. It's a national pediatric cancer precision medicine program, which began in 2015 and is now rolled out to every pediatric hospital in Australia uh, since 2017. Zero currently focuses only on young people with the highest risk cancers. So that means those who have failed all standard lines of treatment or who have no good treatment options left. But we are now funded to expand this program to every child in the country by 2023. This program uses a suite of molecular technologies, including deep whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and methylome profiling. And where possible, we take a piece of tumor and also perform high throughput screening and grow avatars in mouse models to better understand the biology of these tumors and also to provide further treatment options uh, for these high-risk cancers. Essentially, our goal is to analyze each patient's tumor as comprehensively as possible and to distill this information in real time to determine the best treatment recommendations for each patient. So we want the right drug at the right time. And so far, we've recruited over 650 of these high-risk patients. But what's going to happen in, uh, by the end of 2023 is that we're going to recruit all kids with cancer, and that's going to amount to about a thousand new cases each year. The problem with that is it's still a very small number in the big scheme of things. And so where possible, it's imperative that we be able to aggregate our data with global data in order to have the statistical power that Bernie mentioned previously to uh, develop effective strategies in treating high-risk uh, childhood cancer. So we need some way to share, analyze, and integrate this data more easily. Some of our partner collaborators. Yep. And so what I wanted to say was we have two large uh, collaborations uh, uh, with uh, the Kids First and also with St. Jude. Uh, next slide, please. So what you could see from that slide previously was that each of these has thousands and thousands of samples that would be really great if we could integrate somehow. So in terms of CCI, where is our data? We've elected to use uh, NetApp and the storage grid as a way to store uh, all our big data. So those are the bus queues, uh, BAMs, and things like this. And then in collaboration with Seven Bridges, They've announced an international collaboration focused on uh, personalized medicine for kids with cancer, and that includes both that Kids First as well as us and uh, another uh, children's brain um, consortium. 
So all we chose to use basically uh, the Cavatica system for our data analysis because our partners at Kids First use that. And together with Seven Bridges, it was a, an easy fit. And so we do all our analysis in Cavatica by loading our stored data off the storage grid di directly in. But now how do we share this, the results of this with back with Kids First as well as be able to integrate Kids First data with us? So is data, a data commons the answer? And since the Kids First already have an, a Gen3 instance, we thought to explore that. Uh, next slide, please. So this could be a way to share our data, uh, would be to use a Gen3 type data common system to enable us to have a way to search different catalogs of pediatric data, a way to easily gain and grant access to this data, and also a way to analyze this data in place, if that's a possibility. And I'll hand over now to Oliver to describe his motivation for using Gen3. Thanks so much, Marie. Um, let me see if I can give those a try here. It should be set up. Um, right, um, so I'm a bioinformatician over at the University of Melbourne Center for Cancer Research. Um, we're involved in, in various different research activities. The one that's relevant here is the uh, Precision Oncology Program um, that is led by Sean Grimmond and coordinated by the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Center um, and the partner organizations in the precinct. Um, the aim is to explore the use of genomic approaches to improve the outcome for patients uh, with cancer of unmet need. Could be rare cancers, cancer of the unknown primaries, or other cancers with poor outcome. Um, our group at the center focuses specifically on the genomic platform um, through a number of focus areas, and one of which is the development of workflows. Um, by which I mean the whole path from the end of sequencing all the way um, of whole genome uh, transcriptome sequencing to eventually therapeutic recommendations, ideally within 24 hours after the sequencer has been switched off. Um, that also includes things like long-term management of data. And so the platform naturally covers um, different components like the IT infrastructure, um, the primary analysis, think alignment, variant calling, copy and uh, uh, calling, quality control, and we do run this um, on Illumina Connected Analytics uh, and make use for a large um, part of this of the Dragon platform through uh, a partnership that's called the Genomics Hub with Illumina. Um, consider this also my conflict of interest statement. Um, we post-process those uh, primary results then uh, and generate reports um, on our own AWS environment. Um, that involves a fairly extensive number of bioinformatics workflows, tools, sensors, and, and biomarkers that then get summarized in research grade reports, if you will, um, with lots of additional information. And we hand them over to an amazing team of curators who then sift through those, summarize information again for discussion as a molecular tumor board um, and passing on recommendations or at least a synopsis to the treating clinician. Uh, when it comes to capturing our own data, um, we do again rely on AWS. Most of our primary data sits in uh, Glacier or Deep Archive for long-term data that we need to keep around for NATA requirements. Um, and actively used data is, is uh, captured in a portal that allows us to search for previously, analyzed, uh, previously analyzed cancer samples. All of that is inward looking though. Uh, it supports our curators, our bioinformaticians, but none of that is meant for sharing with or really useful to the scientific community or interested patients, really. Um, and as we have previously, external data sharing really is essential for all kinds of reasons. Some of them are outlined here on a slide that I've shamelessly stolen from Tiffany Bordwood, the uh, acting, um, the managing director of Australian Genomics. Um, we need contextual information to make sense of our patient data. Uh, so we want access to data from other cancer researchers. And we also owe it to our patients to make the most of the samples they've entrusted us with. Um, that includes sharing them with the scientific community um, in alignment with a consent agreement. Uh, we do have a sh uh, framework to share aggregate information uh, in a CBIO portal, but that's just that, it's aggregate information. Um, if we want to make primary and secondary information available, we need something else, a proper warehouse that, that supports fair principles, really. And importantly, we really don't want to build or didn't want to build as our own. We'd like to reuse and adapt what is out there, um, which is why we're quite excited when BioCommons approached us initially, 
to evaluate Gen3 in collaboration with Zero, um, because it also allows us not just to test a process solution, but to do this with collaborators. We can to test like immediately um, the data exchange options uh, between two organizations. I do need to point out that none of the work here is mine. Uh, I'm, I'm really just reporting all of the work uh, of, of those individuals, Victor, Andrew, and Florian have been put into evaluating Gen3, deploying it, um, extending the documentation. We'll hear more about this later um, and integrating it both with internal components in our framework, but also external projects that Bernie will talk about later, I think. Um, so if you have any questions at all and, and you're interested in Gen3, you want to know the UMCCR perspective, those are the people you really want to be talking with. So what is Gen3? Let's get to that part. Um, it's, it's a cloud-centric data commons or warehouse, which means it's, it's based on a set of microservices that do all kinds of things. Um, they ingest pointers to file objects alongside the metadata, handle the authentication, access control, uh, and support users in then browsing the files that are there um, or um, helping them to analyze or even retrieve them eventually as needed. Um, why did we look at Gen3 in this specific case when there's so many solutions out there? I mean, there's OpenCGA that's been used by Genomics England. Um, you have Overture from OICR. There is the Human Cell Atlas um, store backend, which supports a number of cancer studies. Um, and really, they all have pros and cons, and I'm happy to get into our evaluation thoughts and some of those during the Q&A. Um, but a strong argument for Gen3 at the time was really the community that supports it. In general, we try to use software that is open, uh, sorry, open source, I should say, uh, and actively maintained, because otherwise we're really just, we're taking over maintenance from that community and, and it ends up on our side. And we want something that has a reasonable chance of still being around in three or maybe even five years from now. And an active community is a really good indicator for this. Um, Gen3 uh, development community is certainly active on GitHub. Um, they also have an active Slack channel um, where they offer support and uh, different implementers can discuss solutions. So I do highly recommend you join uh, these if, if you're thinking of trying Gen3 yourself. Gen3 has also seen an adoption at a fairly broad community of research communities, um, which speaks to its flexibility. Um, and it should allow us to capture cohorts, not just from cancer studies, uh, further down the road and it's an important use case for example for Australian genomics and other collaborators we'd like to bring on board eventually. Um, some of those communities include um, Anvil, um, that's the NHGRI warehouse, it's, it's probably one of the biggest genomic warehouses currently accessible to the public uh, and it, it links to Terror and Galaxy for analysis and while it's not all particularly smooth it, it gives us some confidence in the scalability of Gen3. And a lot of this flexibility comes through the data model that, that Gen3 is built on. It's, it's a very basic graph that describes relationships between um, projects, the subjects that are participating in them, the samples that have contributed, clinical biological properties, and eventually the file objects that are contained there. Uh, nodes in that graph um, have attributes, which ideally require the use of existing terminology standards and ontologies like SNOMAD, ICD-9, HPO, and CO, instead of free text. Not always enforced, but that's each concept. Uh, and while some models like, like Anvil tend to err on the side of simplicity, um, the data model can be really quite complex. Uh, it's, it's not something I'd necessarily advocate for, but the option is there if you have a project you think needs this level of metadata support in the warehouse itself. And then finally, coming back to the modular design, Gen3 itself consists of microservices talking to each other through defined and documented interfaces. So I'm, I'm giving you a quick whirlwind tour of, of some of those components. Uh, please note that all errors and misunderstandings in here are definitely mine. If in doubt, check with the Gen3 community in the documentation. So what do we have? We have uh, Sheepdog. Um, it imports data um, that fits the data model, um, assigns IDs to, to uh, the data that you imported, uh, and records and performs basic quality control. Um, Windmill on the other side, um, is a data portal for the data submission. If you don't want to use the API, um, it supports data searching, querying, data exploration, and the analysis itself. It's probably the most user-facing uh, component in, in all of Gen3. Index3 is assuming like the, one of the core components in there, and it provides globally unique IDs for data objects that get submitted, and then uses those to query and retrieve data. Um, it's an index of file locations and their checksums. 
And it does support multiple um, URL schemas for those files, which means we can track data that sits in, in a diversity of, of object stores and different cloud providers, uh, which was a key requirement for us. Uh, Fence is probably the most involved component, at least for someone who is not familiar with AI. Um, it provides controlled access to resources from the outside world and then allows only trusted entities to enter. And it supports a variety of different uh, ID providers. I've listed a few down there. Um, and uses things like OpenID Connect to generate tokens for clients and users. Gen3 also has a role-based access control um, framework or engine um, that allows grouping users into hierarchies. And so FENS provides the authentication and authorization component. And then the internal access control list provides access to projects as needed, either on read um, or read write access. We can talk about this a little bit more later when we talk about limitations. Um, Peregrine is probably the component we touched the least. Um, it is um, a query framework that supports graph QL queries against the metadata. Um, it's backed by an SQL database. Um, think of it like Sheepdog, sorry, Sheepdog handling the import of data um, and then checking it, and then Peregrine allowing you to query it. Um, and lastly, Gen3 has support for some workspaces. Uh, it comes with a Jupyter Notebook out of the box. Um, so for Python R queries and uh, light uh, analysis of your data. Uh, it can also be connected to external and multiple frameworks. Um, so Anvil has demonstrated this with um, uh, Galaxy. And as Bernie pointed out, a lot of this is possible due to use of standards uh, at the interfaces. Uh, I mentioned OpenID Connect for the authentication which gives us an eye towards G4GH passports eventually, GraphQL for the metadata queries. Uh, IndexD has support for uh, G4GH DRS identifiers. So it means files get a URI that's independent of the actual storage location, which makes it easier to replace individual components um, as long as the interface behaves the same way. Um, it's something we did as a part of a trial for the data access control system. It also makes it easier to integrate with existing infrastructure. So. With all that said, um, how do you give this yourself a try if that sounds interesting, other than just browsing around the, the existing public instances? Um, there are basically two deployment options. Um, the somewhat more straightforward one is based on Docker Compose. That's all in one box, and it's, it's really great for initial exploration. Um, this can run on your laptop, desktop, really just fine. And if you just want to give the framework a spin, maybe edit, edit, edit and then test a couple of data models uh, and then tinker around, I would recommend this approach. It's still an involved process. You do need to be familiar with the command line. You want to know Docker. Um, but if you follow the manuals and, and, and ask in the community, you should be up and running relatively quickly. As an intermediate step, we've also written up guidelines on how to deploy this Docker Compose service on AWS, which is great for trial runs in, in small teams um, before committing to a production and deployment. Uh, it allows you to keep the services running, even if your laptop isn't around. Uh, you can test integration with the infrastructure. Um, we've made the Terraform stack um, available alongside the documentation, how to spin this up if you want to give it a try. Uh, for production environments, I, you do really want to use the full cloud setup. Um, the emphasis for Gen3, to the best of my no, yeah, grasp of the situation, is really focused on AWS. Uh, in principle, there is support for GCP, Azure, OpenStack, um, but you might be uh, a little more experimental there. Um, the deployment is driven by Terraform and Kubernetes um, for cloud automation. And once you start touching that, you're also getting into some significant resources. And it's not just in terms of the, the components that are required on AWS for it. Um, the, the monthly bill tends to be around 1,000, maybe 1,200 Australian dollars. Um, that's before storage costs, just to keep the services running. But realistically, the main cost is in staff expertise that, that is required to set this up, uh, integrated with existing services, and really just troubleshoot all the unavoidable issues that you'll be running into. Good news is once you have it running in, in one of those modes, um, the remaining steps are relatively straightforward. You can grab an existing uh, data model. Um, Gen3 even has a quick start data model that you could use. Uh, you create a data commons um, by pointing it um, uh, Gen3 at this model at the API, and then you can load data and start exploring. And I'm gonna hand over now to Camille to show you what this exploration might look like. Thanks, Bova. So, okay, so right here, we've got the CCI instance um, and right off the bat, we can see, um, as 
as Oliver and Bernie previously mentioned. Um, this is to do with uh, the fence micro service, which um, is mainly associated with the IAM and dealing with authentication and authorization of our users. Um, so right off the bat, we've got, um, uh, with our specific instance, we've integrated uh, support for the CI logon, as well as our Microsoft, which we can um, kind of leverage to allow um, an institute wide level access for our users. So if we go into Microsoft, we can see we can use our own CTIA login, which gets redirected and we're in our instance. Um, now, as you may have noticed with some of all of the slides, um, this is quite similar, um, a boilerplate uh, uh, when compared to something like Anvil. So we've got an, an immediate overview of all of our different projects and cohorts um, and programs um, and kind of a distribution of all the files and experiments and cases we have um, across all of those different cohorts. Um, now, right off the bat, we can have um, a look at our dictionary, um, which Oliver provided a fantastic overview of. Um, and this is a couple of things we'd like to note here. Uh, first of all, um, CCI is still in the process of refining our own data dictionary, um, in addition to harmonizing it with um, other institutes, such as UMTCR. Um, uh, in addition to this, um, I'd like to bring your attention specifically to the core metadata collection. So as Oliver mentioned, this is a specific node with certain attributes. Um, specifically with the core metadata collection, it's essentially um, a way to describe some metadata on um, a project-wide level. Okay, so after we've um, had a look at the dictionary, we can go into submitting data. And this is actually one of the points that Marie um, uh, made a note of that we'd like our users to have access to. So if we go specifically to the CCIA program with the CC0 project, we can go and submit data here. Um, we can make it quite easily with the form submission. Um, if, for example, one of our users, um, say, wanted to um, include an aligned, submit an aligned read, um, the very first thing we'd need is um, an ID to reference a specific core metadata collection. Um, and we can do that by browsing the nodes for this specific project. Now, if we go here, we can go down to the core metadata collection. And this essentially gives us um, a list of all the different instances of this node within our project. So if we go under normal circumstances, you would have um, a very specific core metadata collection you'd like to submit your file to. Um, for the purpose of, purposes of this demo, um, this is quite arbitrary. We can select anything we'd like. Um, and if we just select this specific ID, uh, we can go back to our original tab and just quickly paste that in. Um, for the data category, uh, these are quite small lists and maybe quite quick and easy to, uh, to fill in. Aligned reads, we want whole genome sequencing. For the file name, we can do anything we'd like. Um, for this case, let's do something like P28 to the another patient ID. File size, obviously uh, the file size in MD5 sum would be um, pre-computed and you'd just be putting it in here. Again, for the purposes of this demo, we'd go with something just nice and fast. For the submit ID, this could be anything we'd like. We can do test submission one. And from here, we can generate um, a JSON form, which essentially summarizes all the data we've put in, and that'll go straight into Gen3. Um, one thing to note here is that um, if we don't actually manually change this from a string to a, an integer, it will actually complain and it will fail the submission. Um, but we've done that and we've succeeded here. Now, onto the next part is the exploration. So um, this actually covers another use case that um, CCI is quite uh, interested in, which is we want to allow users to um, kind of peruse um, our data and get an idea of the kind of cohorts um, and how that cohort is structured in terms of um, demographics. So for example, if we'd like to go to the zero project, um, and if, for example, we've got a researcher that wants only the male um, subjects, we can click here and we can see straight away, we've got specifically three cases within the zero project. Um, uh, with that metadata associated with that. Um, now we can go on to the file exploration. Um, and this is uh, in a very similar, similar manner. Um, we've got another use case here, which is if a researcher wants to, for example, um, go to the Zero project and get specifically all the FASTQ files. And we've got them right here. And they can see we've got six files. Uh, we've got a breakdown of the kind of metadata associated with those files as well. Um, and uh, if they like, they can just click on the globally unique ID that Oliver mentioned, um, and they can get access to the file and they can download it directly. 
Um, now, now would be a good time to mention the permissions. Now, um, as Oliver alluded to previously, um, uh, Gen3 right, off, right out of the box, it, it does support um, permissions on a project level, um, but it does not support um, uh, permissions uh, on a file specific level. Um, however, it's worth noting that UMCCR was actually successful in integrating functionality for file specific permissions, um, but you, CCI, we're still in the process of doing that. Um, great, so now we can go back to um, the data submission. Um, and you can see that we've the data has been added to the Zero project. Um, however, it's worth noting here that um, uh, we also still have to upload the actual file separately um, and then map it because what we submitted here was just the metadata, um, which is again, what Oliver mentioned was kind of a pointer uh, to the file um, in, in anticipation. Um, so yeah, those, those are some pointers that we'd like to mention. Um, I'm, I'll pass it back to Oliver now to go into a bit more depth um, into um, the kind of complications we come, came across. Thanks, Oliver. I think we'll probably do a bit more free sharing um, in terms of, of everything else. Um, let's talk about, let's see, uh, Marie, Camille, also jump in um, as, as you can. I, the one that I'm probably jumping on first is the granular control because you just mentioned those, Camille. Um, so something that that we quite often need is not necessarily data access to a given project or cohort on an, an yes or no um, side, but we have slightly more fine-grained um, permission requirements. This could be because we have a complete cohort of, I don't know, pancreatic cancer patients. And some of those patients might have opted out, out of sharing information at all. Or they might have um, opted out of sharing information for commercial research. So that's something we need to honor and we need to be able to, to assign. So um, that would require ideally some, some machine readable consent, like um, the data use ontology assigned to it, that we then can evaluate against um, you know, the external demands, but we don't have that ability in there. Um, this probably goes further than that. We have cases where we, we are okay sharing the somatic information, but not the germline information, um, or cases where we are okay with the variants, but not the read level data. Um, any extreme case, if you follow the example of like Seneca in, in, in Canada or Genomics England, quite often we have whole genome data, but for a given research project, um, we would only have to share specific genomic regions, a couple of genes of interest. So it would be sharing by genomic region. And so none of that is currently supported in Gen3. Um, we, we get around for uh, that for, for Nagam, which Bernie will talk about, um, by basically delegating the file access to a component completely outside of Gen3. Um, the good news that is possible, um, the slightly less good news is that you have to implement those workarounds. So that will be it on the granular control. Um, Camille, do you want to talk about the infrastructure wrestles? Because you're like, otherwise I have to bring back Victor and, and co on the team here to talk about those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and obviously take take what I say with a grain of salt because um, I was, I definitely didn't have the level of expertise <laughs> um, starting off to, to kind of grapple with all the microservices. Um, uh, but yeah, just generally, if, if, if a programmer or an engineer does have uh, you know, a couple of years of experience under their belt, specifically with AWS and maybe even Kubernetes, um, they they probably wouldn't have as much difficulty as we did. Um, but unfortunately, uh, like you said, Oliver, it's 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 the, the probably the most important part is uh, the kind of manpower and the uh, the workers having the capacity to do this kind of work and um, set up a an instance. Yeah, it's it's definitely not something you can just spin up. I would say. Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, what else do we have? We had the data models. Um, it's probably maybe even a misnomer. The data models are not necessarily complex. They can be as complex or as simple as you want them to be. Um, in in when we were working with them, I almost felt like they felt underspecified in many ways to me. I wish there was more. The the available models would be doing a better job of. Um, nailing down or restricting which vocabularies and which terminologies to use and then basically um, absolutely require this. You can do this, it's, it's just rarely enforced. Um, the biggest challenge that we have on the particular collaboration and something that we really learned the hard way is that a Gen 3 instance is tied to its data model. So if you're changing the data model, 
then we have to spin up a new Gen 3 instance. Um, and unless the data models are very, very similar to each other, it, it also makes it quite complex to query across different Gen 3 deployments. Um, that is not a bug, it's a feature from the Gen 3 perspective, but it makes it quite challenging to think about Gen 3 as, a, as, as an answer to a federated warehouse, because then we have to, first of all, all agree on this, and it has to be a data model that captures everything from uh, cancer tumor normal to rare disease trio structures to maybe complex disease cohort uh, analysis. Um, and at that point, you end up with a lot of records and attributes in there that are just going to be empty for the vast majority of cohorts. Um, that's what I had from my side in terms of limitations that we learned as this process. Marie, anything from your side you want to jump in? No, I think you've covered everything. Yeah. Uh, okay. Then, yeah, okay. Moving on. Bernie, are you bringing the session to a close? Yep, thank you very much, Oliver. Um, so um, I guess what I wanna talk about just briefly here is what happens next and in what context is all of this happening nationally? Um, and Oliver's already mentioned NAGIM, which is a national approach to genomics information management. Um, and as, as we said at the start of this um, presentation, the vision for human genomics data sharing in Australia and internationally uh, requires considerable coordination and collaboration. Um, the NAGIM blueprint um, sets out a series of principles to guide decision-making on responsible collection, storage, use, and management of genomics data. Um, and as I mentioned previously, Australian Genomics is developing recommendations for implementing NAGIM. Um, late last year, um, in 2021, um, Australian Genomics led an implementation prototyping phase um, in response to NAGIM. Um, and that submissions to that uh, have been um, assessed by an external panel of experts. And um, we're uh, very shortly receiving feedback on those submissions. And on the right hand side here, we see a diagram of many of the pieces that fit together into this NAGIM um, uh, ecosystem um, and genomic data stores, which we've been talking about, um, particularly Gen 3 today. It's a major central piece of that infrastructure. Um, and I guess another key central piece underlying all of this is user management, um, um, where, where many of these things are talking to each other. They have a concept of who a user is and how, they, um, are, how they're authorized to access the data. And there, there are many, many pieces fitting into this ecosystem. And as Oliver mentioned already, one of the key um, ways of engineering this um, is to design APIs so that, and standards so these components can talk to each other and evolve independently um, in a manageable way, um, and we can replace pieces if necessary. And so um, Gen 3 that we've been talking about today is one of those pieces that can talk to other systems. And so um, another important project that's happening um, in this space is led by the Australian Biocommons. It's called the Human Genomes Platform Project. And we are investigating with the partners on the right-hand side here, um, various pieces of this ecosystem. In particular, we're looking at automated data access committee submissions. So trying to relieve the burden from data access committees to approve access to research data, um, identity and access management, as I mentioned previously, that underpins um, all of this technology. Um, at the top, we've got streamlined submission to data archives. It's just considering how we archive this data for long-term um, storage and reuse. And in the center, we've got um, the development of virtual cohorts for querying across federated data portals. And, um, and, and Gen3 is an example of um, a piece of technology that would support that. And then across all of this, we're supporting that with documentation and training. Uh, and th this project um, is really in some ways um, stepping off from this pilot project of standing up Gen3. And so we're actually taking the results from the standing up Gen3 project that we've talked about today and continuing to build upon that. Um, and another um, interesting project that has um, just begun uh, is um, some work that's again being led by Australian Biocommons, which is supporting Australian cardiovascular disease research um, with the key partners here on the right hand side. Uh, and we have um, recently in the last half year begun working with partners in this space to establish systems to support the identification of biomarkers for increased risk of heart attack. Uh, we're currently midway through an eight month project to establish a new Gen 3 instance. Um, and we're populating that with three coronary, coronary artery disease cohorts. And 
many of the learnings that we've found from the pilot project that's been described today are actually feeding directly into this project here. And it's made the establishment of a new Gen 3 instance uh, much easier because of the learnings that we had from the pilot project. So we're very grateful for the contributions there and all the documentation that um, CCI and UMCCR have contributed. Um, we are investigating data harmonization across cohorts. Uh, and um, we are populating the instance with synthetic data to allow functionality testing. So that's another example of Gen3 being used. And um, we anticipate um, many more of these to come online very soon um, because there are many um, interesting projects around Australia that have genomics, human genomics data that um, want to form these um, federated data access platforms. Okay, and so um, just like to end the um, speaking part of this presentation with acknowledgements of all the people who've contribute, contributed from various organisations. I won't read all of those names out there, but um, we very much appreciate all of the efforts from all the people that have contributed. And you can see clearly that it's um, a very large team of people that have been working on this. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Bernie, Marie, Oliver and Camille. We now have time for questions. So if you do have a question, please do write that into the Q&A box, which you can see in your Zoom dashboard. And I can see there have been a few questions coming in while we were listening to the talks. And the first one that I'm going to kick off with for our speakers is, uh, if you could add one dream feature or improvement to Gen 3, what would it be? Um... All right, I think from, let me just jump in then so everyone else has a bit more time. Um, I think better data access control, um, the fine grain control that I mentioned would help us a lot so we don't have to outsource that. But in practical terms, it's not a technical feature, but I, I wish there was a relatively basic data model um, that could be used for, for minimal cohort representation in Gen 3. Um, and GFWGH is working on that, the Clem Fienost work stream. That is not even close to being finished though. Um, so anything that, that could be used um, at least as a starting point uh, by different groups would be useful. Camille Marie, what's your wish? Same, uh, I think the data model side and the access control uh, for, you know, that's not just project related would be probably the biggest feature. And maybe for someone who's a little bit more unfamiliar with the whole AWS infrastructure, um, maybe some sort of more detailed documentation even might, might uh, go a little ways in terms of us setting up from scratch. So we're hoping at least our documents um, that we've been gathering over, over the course of, of um, standing up the our Gen 3 instances will help others, at least within Australia. Not too sure if that will work uh, sort of worldwide. Yeah. I would agree with uh, Marie's last point. Um, speaking as someone that's definitely within the capacity of um, a junior, more than a senior, <laughs> um, in terms of um, skills and development, um, having, having a bit more um, help and a, a bit more detail within the kind of finicky stuff uh, for the for the um for the tutorial would be fantastic. I think we should write these down so that we can take them into the next projects. So moving on to the next question, uh, this one is: uh, Can you comment on the associated data access application process? How is access controlled for specific users, and how uh, do how are those users managed? Yeah, I can speak to at least CCI's process. So we've got a data access form that you can fill out either at our CCI website or uh, we've got some data at the moment uh, at the EGA that also has a data access agreement. So you basically ask for access, it goes to a data access committee who then sign off and then you would get um, you, we control access that way, at least to our data. At the moment, we allow anything from fast queues, BAMs, BCFs, and then very minimal clinical data um, that is shareable at this point. So we're hoping though that if Gen3 is the way to go, that we have some sort of data access mechanism through there where you know we don't have to do this so piecemeal anymore. 
no, that would be great. So it sounds like the control part is more at the human level at the moment than at the technical yep. level, although there right. are those yep. technical solutions in there to control who can access the data and the different projects. Um, let me just check how we're going for time. We have plenty of time. Um, I wanted to recap a couple of the questions that have been answered in the Q&A panel already. Uh, there was one on uh, where the data is stored. And the question is, can data that is not stored on S3 type storage be associated with a Gen 3 system? Yeah, I think Mary already answered that. Same here, we haven't tested it. I, I don't see a reason why it it wouldn't, but certain features won't work, right? Like uh, unless you can stream the data from from that object store, it might require some extensions. Victor, Andrew, Florian, if anyone of you around, they can type in chat. <laughs> would be appreciated. Short version, we just haven't tested it. Thanks for that. Uh, really good question that's come, just come in as well. Is are you going to keep using Gen three now that the project has happened or finished? Might throw this to Bernie, I think. Um, yeah, so, so well, it's up to UMCCR and CCI to decide on um, what platform they want to use. But my understanding is for the moment, they're going to keep those going. Um, they can comment on that um, if they like. Um, the, the other thing is I mentioned that there's other Gen 3 projects going on in Australia. Well, and of course, around the world, there's so many large ones around the world that um, Oliver mentioned already. Um, so there's quite a community. Um, we, for the Human Genus Platform Project, um, we are building a toolbox of technologies. And so our attitude is not um, necessarily to prescribe any particular technology, rather to pick ones that suit the partners that are involved. Although we'll say that um, CCI and UMCCR are partners in that project and are working with Gen3 at the moment. I also mentioned that um, uh, we have a cardiovascular Gen 3 that we're just setting up now, and um, the plan is to keep that going, um, uh, assuming that it satisfies all our requirements. And I guess that, that we're still, in some sense, piloting this technology. So for the most part, it's doing the things we want, although Oliver and Camille and Marie have already mentioned some potential shortcomings that would like to be addressed. Um, and so... It's hard to say how far in the future these things will go, but that's the current um, uh, intention is to keep the, these systems running. Uh, for you, CCR, we are definitely behind CCI when it comes to data access control management. Um, we'll keep Gen3 around as, as, a, as a platform anyway. Um, we will, because we're also managing the Austrian genomics warehouse, um, that's probably going to be the first actual proof of principle uh, where we're using Gen3 and Anger. Um, connecting the Gen 3 flagship projects as they come out of the, uh, of the private phase into the public phase um, through Gen 3. But there we have an existing DAC backend that we can connect to. So that's a little bit easier. Um, my take would be even if at some point in the future we decide, OK, maybe Gen 3 isn't the right framework for this, at least we have our data organized. Uh, we have a checksum. We've got a validator. We've got uh, associated with metadata. So a transition to I don't know, a different warehouse, a Gen 3.5 or a Terra warehouse or whatever else is going to be much, much simpler. So I think it's a worthwhile investment and exercise one way or another. Yeah, same. I echo the same uh, sentiments as Oliver and Bernie. And for us, because Kids First, um, who are our collaborators, already have a Gen 3 instance, it, it makes sense to keep it going. And work with UMCCR just to be able to share data uh, locally, but then also with, um, for us, it will be important to be able to, to do that data sharing with kids first. Thanks everyone. I can see there's a, a few more questions coming in about data that's, I oh know it's an in answer to the question about um, storage on S3. Um, I'm pretty sure that the audience can't see your response, Victor, so I'm just going to read it out for, for people to, to take it on board. So in relation to data that's not stored on S3, any object store that has S3 compliant can associate with Gen3, uh, i.e. such as S3 GS supported. Also note you would not need to move your existing data, but just need bucket indexing, aka bucket manifest. I think the, the best way forward, if you have questions about that kind of thing, is you can get in touch with the, the Zero or the UMCCR teams and also the Biocommons as well. 
which probably is a good point to ask the question is how can we get in touch with these teams and to find out more about what's happening let's feel that from our side like just yeah you set a contact information in there reach out happy to answer questions anytime uh, but uh, I think Bernie is probably a better part uh, partner for this for the via comments because it's it's a way broader um, community. There we go. Thanks, Mario. Yep. Um, yep. Absolutely. So um, we welcome any queries or um, people contacting us about what we've talked about today or related topics. Um, the Australian via comments. If you go to the website, um, it. It's um, easy to find um, and we have a contact address there that you can email to directly and you'll get a response very quickly. Otherwise, you can, um, for example, email myself immediately if you want to, um, bernie at biocommons.org.au um, and um, you can um, find out more from there. Um, in the chat, we've got um, a, a direct support um, email address for Gen3 if you're interested in that um, directly. Another thing to look for on the Australian Biocommons website is we have a overview of the Human Genomes Platform Project. If you're interested in finding more about that particular project, for example, which sort of covers some of the things we've talked about today. Um, but you know, any one of those mechanisms will get you um, eventually to talk to one of us um, and we'll respond quickly. Thanks so much, Bernie. So yeah, so the best way to get in touch is just to, to drop us an email and we'll get back to you. Um, I think that's a good place for us to wrap up the webinar for today. So thank you so much to all of our speakers, to Bernie, Marie, Oliver and Camille for joining us today and sharing their experiences with Gen3. And thank you to all of you for coming along as well. Uh, just as we leave today, a couple more things to tell you about. Uh, we have another webinar coming up next month on conservation genomics in the age of extinction. If you're interested in joining that event or any of our other events, you can find more details on those on the Biocommons website under the events tab. So thanks once again to all of our speakers and thank you for joining us. As we leave the webinar today, I'd just like to acknowledge that the Australian Biocommons is enabled by NCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. Thanks so much for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. Take care.